He created the universe. To him belong the heavens and the earth. The ever living, he is the first. He's the owner of mercy. He sent his messengers. when again if you have to go back to when uh, your childhood and your adolescent period when you were growing up what was your exposure we have spoken about your exposure to islam in your household what was your expo your upbringing with islam rather what was your exposure to other religions whether it is hinduism whether it is christianity you went to a convent school so what were there any defining uh, incidents were there, were there any incidents which evolved your understanding of other religions hinduism christianity before you took to studying them or studying the scriptures or studying the texts before i studied myself i was like a general indian right but naturally i had non muslim friends i went to a convent school right. so but naturally i knew little bit about the bible more than the other religions besides islam one thing is islam from whom little bit of the bible because i went to a convent right. school i studied in st peter's high school in masgon right. and little bit of hinduism just from the whether it be comics whether it be hearsay whether it be serials so this was my knowledge about religion like a layman like any other indian but when i studied i found there was a difference of chalk and cheese right between what the scripture said and between what the followers practiced that is the reason i always say that if you want to understand a religion don't look at the followers go to the authentic sources right. if you want to know about hinduism don't look at the hindus go to the vedas Right. If you want to know about Christianity, right. don't look at the Christians. Go to the Bible. Similarly, if you want to know about Islam, right. don't look at the Muslims. Right. Go to the Quran and the authentic things of the Prophet. So when I read, when I studied, I found there was a difference of chalk and cheese between what is the general perception right. of religion right. as compared to what is mentioned in the scriptures. For example, it's a common perception that in Hinduism, the basic thing of worship is idol worship. and if you ask today the hindus majority more than 95% would agree that the basic form of worship is idol worship now if you read the vedas right. which is the most authentic amongst all the scriptures of hinduism right it is absolutely against idol worship you read the vedas if you read the upanishads right. for example as i said mentioned chandogya upanishad right. chapter number 6 section right. number 2 verse number 1 ekam evdityam right. god is only one without a second it's mentioned in the sutra sutra upanishad chapter number 6 verse number 9 nacha sikasi janita nacha dipa of that god there is no lord he has got no parents right. that normality god has got no superior he has got no father he has got no mother right. it's mentioned in sutra sutra upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 nacha sipa timasti of that god there is no pratima right. pratima is a sanskrit word which means photograph right. picture painting image idol statue right. so it's mentioned nartasya pratima asti of that god there is no pratima there is no image there is right. no photograph there is no right. painting there is no picture there is no statue there is no idol there is right. no sculpture and the same may be repeated in right. the jurved right. chapter number 3 to verse number 3 right. nartasya pratima asti of that god there is no image so when i studied i found that this is similar to what is mentioned in the quran right when i studied the bible i saw that even in the bible the same thing is mentioned So then based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 says talu ila kalimatin sawa in baina bainakum come to common terms as between us and you right. which is the first term Allah na abda illallah that we worship number one god so then i started finding the commonalities between the various religions right i am not saying that there are no differences differences are there many right. unlike other people when they deal with interfaith dialogue what they say like you have interfaith dialogue There's a Christian priest coming and saying all religions are the same. Christianity is the same as Hinduism. It is the same as Islam. A Hindu comes and says all religions are same. Hinduism is same as Christianity. Right. Christianity is same as Islam. Islam is same as Hinduism. Then a Muslim joker comes and he says the same thing. Islam is the same as Hinduism. Hinduism is same as Christianity. I ask a basic question. If I ask that Christian priest that if all religions are same, will you become Muslim? He'll say no. I'll ask the pundit, will you become a Christian? He'll say no. Allah is a Muslim. Will you become a Christian? He said no. Right. So if all religions are the same, if I say five plus five is equal to ten, right. whether I give you two five rupees note or one ten rupees note, it is the same. Right. But here the answer will be no. 
So then I realized that there are differences. But let us talk about the commonalities rather than differences. And don't try and fool the people that all religions are exactly the same. Fine, the goal may be the same. So after doing all this research, I give a formula which will be acceptable to all the human beings. Anyone who believes in religion. I started telling, and now also I say, that let us agree that one scripture is 100% the word of God. So Hindu will not have objection in believing that Veda is 100% the word of God. The Christian will say, I don't mind believing Bible to be 100% the word of God. The Muslim will say, I don't mind believing Quran to be 100% the word of God. Right. So then I say, let us agree to follow what is common in all these scriptures. What is different, we'll talk tomorrow. What is different, whether right or wrong, we'll discuss tomorrow. Let us agree that what is common in all these scriptures, let us agree to follow 100%. What is different, maybe we can discuss tomorrow, right or wrong. In this way, I started finding the communities and telling the people of all the very different faiths, whether it be Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, that let us agree to follow what is common in all these scriptures and no one should object to that. Right. And that's how I started getting people to my talks, getting all the different people and saying that all the religions, if you read, talk about one God. Right. All the religions, whether it be Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, Judaism, say that God has got no idol, has got right. no image, right. let's worship him alone. That's the first point. Right. Then talking about messengers. Let us agree to follow right. the messengers. And all the scriptures, whether it be the Bible, whether it be Hindu scripture, whether it be Jewish scripture, whether it be Quran, it says that there is a last and final messenger to come, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. I said, let's follow that. So in this way, I started showing the people that the basic form of worship in all the religions is that you should prostrate, that put your foil onto the ground. Whether it's in the Bible you read, in the Genesis, chapter number 7, verse number 3, in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verse number 6, in the book of Joshua, chapter 5, verse number 14, whether it be the Quran, whether it be the Hindu scriptures, Shashtang, putting your eight parts of your body onto the ground. So then we realized that all the scriptures say the same thing, how to offer right. prayers. Right. The other things which are different, let us discuss tomorrow. When all the scriptures say believe in one God, all the scriptures say God has got no images, don't do idol worship, better follow that. All the scriptures say believe in messengers, all the scriptures say believe in the final messenger Prophet Muhammad, let's do that. All the scriptures say that when you have to worship Almighty God, put your forehead on the ground. What is different, we'll discuss tomorrow. In this way, I did more research. All the scriptures say that you should not have alcohol. All the scriptures say you should not gabble. So I did research on those things which were not known. All the religions saying should not lie, is common. Everyone knows that. Right. All the religions do not drop, everyone knows that. So I did not pay stress on those human values which a normal human being knows. Not right. to rob, not to cheat, not to lie. Right. Because this everyone knows. These are human values right. which are there in all the major religions. So I started talking about those things which people did not know. You said something, there was something very interesting which you said, which was quoted, which was about uh, that men and women in Islam they are equal but not identical. Yes. So they are to be treated separately in that sense. But in today's world, you know, woman is not the same as a woman, is not the same as she was, let us say, 20 or 30 years ago. Because a lot of modernity has come into place. There are modern systems, uh, there are modern ways of life. You know, a lot of women are out there earning. So what, I mean, what has shaped your understanding of the woman of women today? of women in today's world and how they might take to the teachings which were there and which are still there, you know. But how do you think they will adjust? You rightly said that I always say in my talks that men and women in Islam are equal, but equality doesn't mean identicality. Right. They're equal, but they are not identical. Because men and women, they are made biologically different, physiologically different, right. physically different, right. psychologically different. Now, Almighty God, who is our creator, depending upon the way he has made the woman biologically, physically, psychologically, he has made different roles for them. Sometimes both are exactly the same. Sometimes they may differ. So based on this, Almighty God is our creator. He has laid down the guidance in the Quran 1400 years ago. Okay. Now, these guidelines, when the creator who created us has laid down, it will always remain the same till the end. And to prove that scientifically, because he's the creator, he knows his creation better than us. He's a better doctor than us. Fine. So based on that, what I say, 
but the understanding of that may change. Fine? For example, the first verse, as I told you earlier, the two verses to be revealed of the Quran was, Read, recite, proclaim in the name of the Lord who created, who created the human being from a congealed lot of blood. Because alaka, one of its meaning is congealed lot, and that's what the people believe initially. Besides congealed lot, alaka also means a leech like substance. So now my understanding of the Quran has increased. But the verse is the same. Right. That human being, besides being created from congealed lot of blood, he is also created from something like a leech like substance. Alaka also means something which clings. And today we know that the embryo in the initial stages clings to the uterine wall, the mother, nine months. So today, after science is advanced, my understanding of the Quran has increased. Besides right. congealed lot of blood, the embryo looks like a leech, it also clings to the uterine wall. Right. So because science has advanced, my understanding of the Quran has increased. Right. Fine? But that does not mean the law has changed. Right. The law is the same. Right. And whatever has been told by the Prophet, that understanding which is clarified will never change. There are some things which are ambiguous because science wasn't advanced. Right. So that thing when science advances, we come to know more. But the law will never change. The basic will remain the same. So there are certain guidelines laid down how a man and woman should lead. Right. So based on that, when I give my talk on women's rights in Islam, I say men and women are equal, but equality doesn't mean anticality. You ask the question that today the world is advanced and women can work. There is no text in the Quran right. which says women cannot work. As long as the work she is doing is halal, it is permitted and within the purview of the Islamic Sharia. That's a different thing that the onus of earning the bread, earning the money is put on the shoulders of the man. In Islam, before a woman is married, right. it is the duty of the father and the brother. And after she is married, it is the duty of the husband and the son to look after lodging, boarding, clothing and all financial aspects. In Islam, a woman need not work. Of the grave danger. Har lamha usi ka zikr ho jo ham sab ki fikr karta hai. पूरा अपना वादा करता है हम सब करिस का पुशादा करता है नए कामाल के बदले हमारे माल में इजाफा करता है اختیار میں جو نوازتہ ہے بے حساب رزق میں خیر و برکت کے اسباب ہر جمعہ رات شام چار بجے اور دوبارہ صبح ساڑھے چار بجے انڈیا میں پیس ٹی وی اردو پر مارج او ڈیوارس سلیوشن او پرابلم ہیون او ہیل یو چوز Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half. हर सनीचर रात आठ बजे और दोबारा सुबह दस बजे इंडिया में पीस टीवी उर्दू पर शी नीड नॉट वर्क एंड नो वन कैन फोर्स टू वर्क बट इफ शी वांट्स टू वर्क एंड शी वांट्स टू कंट्रीब्यूट शी कैन कंट्रीब्यूट एज लॉन्ग एज द वर्क शी डज इज विद इन द पर्व्यू ऑफ द इस्लामिक शरिया Right. We don't believe that a woman should expose the body. Therefore, jobs which involve exhibiting the body, like modeling, like dancing, these things are prohibited in Islam. 
there are many jobs which are prohibited for both men and women. Right. For example, doing any dishonest business is prohibited for the woman as well as for the man. Right. Working in a gambling den, because gambling is prohibited according to all the religions, whether a man works in a gambling den or a woman works, it is prohibited. Right. Working in an alcoholic bar. So right. some jobs are prohibited for both men and women. So what we realize is that Islam does not prevent a woman from working anyway as long as she maintains the modesty. And if she works, she is entitled for the same pay which is due to the man if the work is permitted in Islam. Right. So there's no text at all. Right. But a woman can put her foot down and say, I don't want to work. No one can force her, but a man cannot. A man is a bed owner. So here the option is given to the woman that if she wants, she can work. But no one can force her to work because the bed owner in Islam is the man. And the woman, she has a greater role. That's the reason in Islam, the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Right. And in Islam, according to Hadith of the Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Adab, right. chapter number 2, Hadith right. number 2, a man approached the Prophet and asked him that who deserves the maximum companionship in this world? The Prophet said, mother. The man asked after that too. The Prophet said, mother. The man asked after that too. Again, the Prophet said, mother. The man asked after that too. Then for the fourth time, the Prophet said, your father. That right. means 75%, three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to the mother, 25%, right. one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. So these are the teachings of Islam. So here, the role of woman as a mother is far superior than any other role. That is the reason the Prophet said that even if you give all the wealth in the world to your mother, you cannot compensate for what she has done that she has borne you for nine months in the womb. Right. So this is the respect. Unlike other religions, pregnancy is a curse. The women are looked down upon. Right. So yeah, Islam uplifts the woman. So these are the teachings of Islam. As you, again, if you had to go, up, go back to uh, the time when you grew up, before you took to this path, what did your understanding of, how did your understanding of terrorism evolve? Was it through, just through media? Was it through discussions, possibly discussions with a friend within the household? Because issues which are there today, issues of Kashmir, issues of Palestine, were very well there at that time as well. So how did your understanding of this evolve? Yes, amongst the first few lectures that I gave in 1993, 95, 96... So this is from before your lectures also, if you could talk about that, right from before. Right Fine. Now, right. So as if you see my lectures from 1993 right. to 2000, right. I doubt whether I gave any talk on terrorism. It started after 2000. Right. Right? Yes, therefore, I had given a talk on the most common questions asked by non-Muslims. And I said the most common question was that why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? Fine, it came down. And regarding terrorism, I think it was number four or five, number five, that Muslim is a fundamentalist and a terrorist. That was towards 99. So in one of my talks, a small portion was regarding Muslims are being labelled as fundamentally as a terrorist. Right. But after 2001, after 9-11, after 9-11, and after a couple of years later on, when thousands of books were written against Islam, regarding terrorism, etc., in my talk of most common questions, the question on terrorism became on top of the charts. Then I gave a new talk, terrorism and jihad and Islamic perspective. So, but naturally in the Quran, there were talks, I did read about Bhagavad Gita, about Bible, here and there. But then I specially prepared a talk on this topic. And I think the first time I gave this talk was in 2002. That's in Chennai. Terrorism and Jihad and Islamic Perspective. And for that, the Consul General of South India, of Chennai, the US Consul General, he was the chief guest. That's the first time I gave the talk, in more detail. And the understanding what do we see in the media? And in that talk I said, the most misunderstood word in Islam is the word jihad. Right. It is not only misunderstood by the non-Muslims, it's also misunderstood by the Muslims. Today, the way the media presents something, people start thinking it's a fact. And most of the people, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they think that jihad means any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for power, whether it be for land, any war fought by any Muslim is called as jihad. This is a misconception. 
jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, right. which means to struggle. Right. Anyone who strives and struggles is called a person doing jihad. But in the Islamic context, it particularly means that a person who strives against his own evil inclination, right. this is called as jihad. In Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad in Islamic context means to strive and struggle against oppression. Right. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in the battlefield in self-defense. So this is the meaning of jihad basically, means to strive and struggle. Right. But the way the media presents Islam, the way media presents what is jihad, right. and most of the non-Muslims, they translate jihad as holy war. This holy war, if you convert into Arabic, it means harbum muqaddasa. Harbum muqaddasa is nowhere to be found in the Quran, neither in the saint of the Prophet. Right. This word holy war was first used by the crusaders. Crusade coming from the word cross. Right. And in the name of religion, if any religion that has killed the maximum innocent human beings, it is Christianity. The word which was used for the Christians today is used for the Muslims. So all these words, negative words, holy war was used for the Christians. Right. If you know the word fundamentalist, who it was used for? If you read the Westbrook Dictionary, it says that fundamentalism is a movement which started in the early part of the 20th century by a group of Christians, by a group right. of Protestant Christians, right. who protested that previously they believed that the message of the Bible was from God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and said that not only is the message of the Bible from God, every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If someone can prove that every word, every letter of the Bible is from God, then this movement is a good movement. But if someone on the contrary can prove that every word of the Bible is not the word of God, then this movement is not a good movement. Right. So initially it was used for the Protestant Christians. Right. Similarly, if you read the definition of the word fundamentalist in the Oxford Dictionary, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scripture of any religion. That was the definition. But if you read the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, the slight change, it says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient scriptures of an religion, especially Islam. So the word especially Islam has been added. So what was used earlier for the Christians, right. the word fundamentalist, right. the word fundamentalism, right. the word crusade, the holy war, right. is now used by the same Christians and the Muslims. Right. So what we realize that this is the media how it portrays. And whoever today is in power, Whatever label that person gives, it gets stuck on to the person. Right. You said in an interview a very interesting phrase. This was in an interview to the Indian Express. You said, I am a fundamentalist, but not a fanatic. So could you just explain that? Uh, yes, in the context, I said that, uh, I did say that. And always say that fundamentalist by definition means a person who follows the fundamentals of one particular subject. For example, if a person who wants to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he can't be a good mathematician. Right. If a person wants to be a good scientist, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he's a fundamentalist in the field of science, he can't be a good scientist. But you can't paint all fundamentals the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. Right. For example, if there's a fundamentalist robber whose profession is to rob, then he's bad for the society. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose profession is to save thousands of human lives, then he's a good person. So depending in which field the person is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. As far as I'm concerned, I am a fundamentalist Muslim and I am proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim because I know, I follow and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be a few fundamentals who the people may think are wrong or against humanity, but the moment you give the logical reason and the background for it, there is not a single fundamental of Islam which any human being can point out which is against humanity as a whole. So that's the reason I say that I'm a fundamental Muslim. But the basic question, what is the difference between a fundamentalist and a fanatic? A fanatic is a person who does excessiveness. You know, there's another word which is, I describe what's fanatic. You know, Muslims are labeled as extremist. I say, I'm an extremist. I'm extremely kind, I'm extremely merciful, I'm extremely loving, right. I'm extremely just. What's wrong in being an extremist? As long as you're extremist in the right direction, 
You should not be extremist in the wrong thing. And Quran says that you have to be extremely kind, extremely merciful, extremely honest, extremely just. Right. There's no one in the world who can prove to me that being extremely kind, just and honest is wrong. Right. So I'm an extremist Muslim. Right. But there's a difference between an extremist and a fanatic. A fanatic is someone who commits excessiveness. And Quran says that in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171. La taglu fi dinukum. Do not commit excesses in your religion. Right. Means you should not commit excesses. Means you can go to extreme. That means if there is, you can say that there is a range which is permissible, which is allowed in any particular law, any particular religion, you are allowed to go to the extreme of that range. But excessive means going beyond the boundaries. So being an extremist, as long as that extremism is good for humanity, there's nothing wrong in being an extremist. I know this word is a negative term, mainly used for, right. you know. So I say the word fanatic is different. Right. Fanatic means someone who goes to excessive. He created the universe. To him belong the heavens and the earth. The ever-living, he is the first. He's the owner of mercy. His messenger